Hello scholars, welcome to IELTS listening test. The IELTS listening test is 40 minutes long. Audio would be not more than 30 minutes. You will have 10 minutes to transfer your answer. Good luck. The test is in four part. Part 1, part 2, part 3 and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a student looking for a host family and a housing advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning. How can I help you? Good morning. Um, I understand you help fix up students with host families. That's right. Are you interested in... Uh... Yes. Well, please sit down and I'll just take a few details. Oh, thank you. Right. Now, what name is it? Jenny Chan. Can you spell that, please? Yes. J-E-N-N-Y-C-H-A-N. -N right. And what is your present address? Seaview Guest House, 14 Hill Road. Okay. And do you know the phone number there? Yes, I, I have it here. Um, uh, two two three seven six seven six. But I'm only there after about seven p.m. So when would be the best time to catch you? I suppose between nine and let me see, half past before I leave for the college. Great. And can I ask you your age? I've just had my 19th birthday. And how long would you want to stay with the host family? I'm planning on staying a year, but at the moment I'm definitely here for four months only. I have to get an extension to my permit. You're working on it? Mm. Fine. And what will be your occupation while you're in the UK? Studying English. And what would you say your level of English is? <laughs> um... Good, I think. I'd like to say advanced, but my written work is below the level of my spoken, so I suppose it's intermediate. Mm, certainly your spoken English is advanced. Anyway, which area do you think you would prefer? Um, well, I'm studying right in the centre, but I'd really like to live in the northwest. That shouldn't be a great problem. We usually have lots of families up there. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. And do you have any particular requirements for diet? Well, I'm nearly a vegetarian. Not quite. Shall I say you are? It's probably easier that way. <laughs> that would be best. Anything about your actual room? Uh, I would prefer my own facilities. En suite, is that right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also, if it's possible, a TV. And I'd also like the house to have a real garden rather than just a yard, somewhere I could sit and be peaceful. Is that all? Well, I'm really serious about improving my English, so I'd prefer to be the only guest, if that's possible. No other guests. Yes, you get more practice that way. Anyway, obviously, all this is partly dependent on how much you're willing to pay. 
What did you have in mind? I was thinking in terms of about sixty to eighty pounds a week, but I'd go up to a hundred if it was something special. Well, I don't think we'd have any problems finding something for you. Oh, good. And when would you want it for? I'd like to move in approximately two weeks. Let me see. It's the tenth today, so if we go for the Monday, it's the twenty-third of March. Yes. Right. Good. And if I could ask one last question. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a talk about pandas. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Okay, I'm here today to talk to you all about the panda. It is a species of bear that is under great threat from the damage that humans are doing to the places where they live. The panda is a peaceful animal that has a black and white coat and is loved around the world. It is a distinctive symbol of China. And the panda has also been the logo of the WWF. That's the Worldwide Fund for Nature. Since it was set up in 1961, it is a member of the bear family. They live mainly in bamboo forests high in the mountains of western China. A panda's daily menu consists almost entirely of the leaves, stems, and shoots of various bamboo plants. Bamboo contains very little nutritional value, so pandas must eat twelve to thirty-eight kilograms every day to meet their energy needs. Newborn pandas are about the size of a stick of butter, so that is really small. But they can grow up to three hundred and thirty pounds as adults. They are dependent on their mothers for the first few months of their lives. Panda cubs start to climb trees when they are only six months old, and as adults, the pandas make excellent climbers. Despite their big weight, a panda's average life in the wild is fourteen to twenty years. But a panda can live up to thirty years when they are looked after in places such as zoos. So why do we worry about pandas so much? Why are they important? Well, pandas play a very important part in the bamboo forests where they live by spreading seeds, which helps plants and trees to grow. In the Yangtze Basin, where pandas live, the forests are full of a vast variety of amazing wildlife, such as dwarf blue sheep, multi-coloured pheasants, and other species that are in danger of extinction, including the golden monkey. Also, pandas bring huge economic benefits to local communities through ecotourism. Pandas have two main threats. The first is hunting, which is a constant concern. Poaching or killing the animals for their fur has declined due to strict laws and greater public awareness of the panda's protected status. But hunters seeking other animals in panda habitats continue to kill pandas accidentally. They are also threatened by habitat loss. In other words, by the loss of the home where they live. China's Yangtze Basin region is where the panda's main home is. But this area is an important economic region for this booming country. So roads and railroads are being built, and these are increasingly destroying the forest. This means that panda populations get separated, and so they can't find a partner to mate with and have babies. Destroying the forest also reduces pandas' access to the bamboo they need to eat to survive. Now you have some time to look at questions fifteen to twenty.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 15 to 20. So what is being done to protect the panda? The Chinese government has established more than 50 panda reserves. Reserves are places in the wild where animals are protected. However, only around 61% of the country's panda population is protected by these reserves. The WWF is also playing a big part in protecting the panda. The idea for the WWF logo came from Chi Chi, a giant panda that had arrived at London Zoo in 1961, the same year WWF was created. The people who set up the WWF were aware of the need for a strong symbol that everybody around the world would recognise. They agreed that the big, furry animal with her cuddly, black-patched eyes would make an excellent logo. This has helped to encourage many people to help support the panda. Controversially, a well-known television presenter called Chris Packham, who has hosted programmes about animals for many years on British TV, said pandas might not be worth saving. He explained that pandas are extraordinarily expensive to keep going. We spend millions and millions of pounds on this one species, but much less on others. He argues that it would be better to take all this money we spend on pandas and look after other natural places such as rainforests around the world. He says we have to accept that some animals are stronger than others. The panda is a bear that eats a type of food that isn't very nutritious. It gets diseases easily and it's very difficult to breed. He thinks that extinction is very much a part of life on Earth and we're going to have to get used to it in the next few years because climate change is going to result in all sorts of animals disappearing. However, I don't agree with him. The panda is quite a weak animal, but this is not why it is going to die or become extinct. When he says that if you leave them be, they will die out, that's simply not true. The reason it is in danger is because of the damage that humans are doing to the forests that they live in. If we don't destroy this, then they will survive in the same way that they have for thousands of years. And also, the places where the pandas live should be protected anyway. The panda shares its home with the red panda, golden monkeys, and various birds that are found nowhere else in the world. The panda's numbers are increasing in the wild, so I don't see them dying out. OK, I hope you've enjoyed my short talk on pandas. Are there any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a woman inquiring about a media studies program. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. I'm looking for some advice about doing a master's degree in media studies. Am I at the right place? Yes, my name's Mark. I'm head of the media studies course. Nice to meet you. And you are? I'm Louise. Nice to meet you too. So how can I help you? Well, I've seen the prospectus for the course, but I'm still a bit confused about a few things and about some of the options for studying. What's your situation at the moment? Are you working? Yes, I've been working as a journalist for a local newspaper for the last three months. Prior to that I had two jobs in the media, at a small local radio station for about two years and at a TV station for about four years. So I've worked in media for about six years in total. OK, well that's useful if you want to do the course. What's your motivation to do further study? I enjoy my job a lot at the moment but I feel the opportunities for promotion are quite limited. 
It's not that I think a master's will help with this, though. I'll probably leave my job, maybe to go into TV or something, but basically I think wherever I end up going in the future, employers prefer to see someone with postgraduate qualifications these days. And are you intending to study full-time? Well, I'd really like to keep working as I need an income. What are the options for me if I want to work while studying? You could do certain modules over a number of years if you like. It's up to you how many you do. Basically, you get credits for the ones that you complete. People usually do the Masters in anything from 18 months up until four years. It depends on your time. If you wanted a fixed schedule and attendance and did it part-time, then that would be a total of three years. So what's the admission criteria to join the course? Well, there are a few things that are useful but not essential. But there are some requirements. Usually, to join a Masters, people must have a bachelor's degree. But we are prepared to overlook this if someone has enough work experience. But you must have one or the other. It's useful if you have research experience, as you have to complete a thesis. But we can train you on this if not. It is essential that you have motivation if you want to join the course, as it is very demanding. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk on a social history of the East End of London. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In the last few weeks, we've been looking at various aspects of the social history of London. And this morning, we're continuing with a look at life in the area called the East End. I'll start with a brief history of the district and then focus on life in the first half of the 20th century. Back in the 1st to the 4th centuries AD, when the Romans controlled England, London grew into a town of 45,000 people, and what's now the East End, the area by the River Thames and along the road heading north-east from London to the coast, consisted of farmland with crops and livestock, which helped to feed that population. The Romans left in 410, at the beginning of the 5th century, and from then onwards, the country suffered a series of invasions by tribes from present-day Germany and Denmark, the Angles, Saxons and Jutes, many of whom settled in the East End. The technology they introduced meant that metal and leather goods were produced there for the first time. And as the East End was by the river, ships could transport goods between there and foreign markets. In the 11th century, in 1066 to be precise, the Normans conquered England, and during the next few centuries London became one of the most powerful and prosperous cities in Europe. The East End benefited from this, and because there were fewer restrictions there than in the city itself, plenty of newcomers settled there from abroad, bringing their skills as workers, merchants or moneylenders during the next few hundred years. In the 16th century, the first dock was dug, where ships were constructed, eventually making the East End the focus of massive international trade. And in the late 16th century, when much of the rest of England was suffering economically, a lot of agricultural workers came to the East End to look for alternative work. In the 17th century, 
the East End was still a series of separate, semi-rural settlements. There was a shortage of accommodation, so marshland was drained and built on to house the large numbers of people now living there. By the 19th century, London was the busiest port in the world, and this became the main source of employment in the East End. Those who could afford to live in more pleasant surroundings moved out, and the area became one where the vast majority of people lived in extreme poverty and suffered from appalling sanitary conditions. That brief outline takes us to the beginning of the 20th century, and now we'll turn to housing. At the beginning of the century, living conditions for the majority of working people in East London were very basic indeed. Houses were crowded closely together, and usually very badly built, because there was no regulation. But the poor and needy were attracted by the possibility of work, and they had to be housed. It was the availability rather than the condition of the housing that was the major concern for tenants and landlords alike. Few houses had electricity at this time, so other sources of power were used, like coal for the fires which heated perhaps just one room. Of course, the smoke from these contributed a great deal to the air pollution for which London used to be famous. A tiny, damp, unhealthy house like this might well be occupied by two full families, possibly including several children, grandparents, aunts and uncles. Now, before I go on to health implications of this way of life, I'll say something about food and nutrition. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet. Hope this helped you. Please like, share and subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell icon.